Hello, so can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Perfect. So I'm Kevin, I'm a PhD student here at the Francis Crick Institute. I have to say that after being, you know, seeing these talks as the only non-doctor here and suffering from a massive case of, you know, you know imposter syndrome, but you know, such a science, but I will not be presenting any of my own data because as a second year PhD student, I have not had time to acquire anything worth discussing. <laughs> As soon as you can tell from my accent, I am not British. I am, in fact, from this lovely place, Vancouver, in the west coast of Canada. Um, I have to say that it was a pretty fantastic place to grow up. Um, it's, you know, when Alfredo, when you showed the number of uh, LGBT STEM Day events, I noted that there were like 20 in Vancouver. Fantastic. <laughs> but anyway, um, it was a fantastic place to grow up. I did my undergrad there, I did all of my early uh, lab placements there. And I have to say, uh, this is my view from my London <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver. Not great. Um, the other thing about Vancouver that's fantastic is, you know, we, you know, it's on the beach. It's by the mountains. We would go skiing after work on in during the winter. We'd go play beach volleyball. Can't really do that in the Thames. Sorry, <laughs> but you know, here I am. But in any case, what's the other interesting thing about Vancouver is that in in 1996, when I was one year old, um, this was the Vancouver was the location of the 11th International AIDS Conference, and this is historically a pretty important conference because where what happened at this conference were the first results of combination therapy for treating HIV. And what this means is that basically you can use three different drugs to target different parts of the virus, and with that, it prevents the virus first of all from replicating but also from mutating away and so on. And this has become the standard of care now for HIV treatment, and is the reason why, if diagnosed with AIDS, it no longer represents a death sentence as it would have 25, 30 years ago. And this has been pretty interesting for me as a gay man growing up in a city known for its AIDS research. You know, as scientists, we like to think that you know, science and scientists as well are you know, objective and clean and not influenced by society. And I think this has led to some pretty interesting you know, self-reflection on what it means to have grown up in an environment. You know, I'm a gay man working on retroviruses. I was just talking earlier um, you know, within the Crick Institute, where can you find all the gay men? Either in the immunology department or the retrovirus department. And, and my lab is called Retroviral Immunology, and here I am. <laughs> but I think this is why these events like today are so important, and this is why this is so gratifying to see so many of you here, is that, you know, I think there's a growing appreciation, especially in cities like London and Vancouver, that science scientists are informed by society, that our science feeds back in society, and hopefully there's a closer connection there. So now a little bit of science. First of all, what is a retrovirus? So HIV, as I mentioned, is the classical example of a human retrovirus. There are all sorts of others, some of which I study in the lab. Um, this is an electron microscopy image of a virus, basically meaning you take a virus and you slice it in half and you take a really, really small picture of it. Um, your typical retrovirus is about 100 nanometers um, in diameter, so about you know, 750, 1,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. Um, and as you can see, there is sort of an outer ring. This is called the envelope, and this is the bit that holds the virus together um, and also shields it from the immune system. And you can, as you might be able to see inside, there are these little smaller circles, and this is called the capsid. And this is the bit that uh, contains all of, the deep, uh, of the, all of the genetic material for the virus that allows it to spread and turn into more viruses. So why is it called a retrovirus? Uh, when we learn about, you know, from your classical undergraduate uh, genetics course, you learn about this thing which we call the central dogma. And this is the idea that you have your genetic material, your DNA, and that this turns into protein through this RNA intermediate. And these proteins are the bits in your cell that you know, exert their function, make a cell what it is, and do everything a cell is supposed to do. Um, and all living organisms, from humans to dogs to bacteria, have their information flowing through in this exact manner, from DNA to RNA to protein. The one exception to this rule is retroviruses. So the genetic material of a retrovirus is RNA, and then they transform it back into DNA, so that the opposite of what every, everyone else does, hence the name retro. 
So why is this important for a viral replication? How does this benefit the virus? So this is sort of the textbook schematic of uh, viral replication. So basically at the top you have this retrovirus, it sticks to a cell, it goes into the cell, and basically the points I want you to focus on are that, so you have this blue uh, DNA that's been reverse transcribed from the genetic material of the virus, and then what a retrovirus is really good at doing, and this is quite unique, is that it takes its DNA in blue and then basically just inserts it into the DNA of the infected cell, which is seen here in green. And so you have this weird hybrid virus-human DNA mix. Um, and this is particularly interesting from a virology perspective, because you have different types of viruses, they all infect in different ways. You have some viruses that are sort of quick and dirty, like the flu, um, these, you know, infect the cell, they break out, explode everything after them, and kill the cell. In contrast, you have these viruses that include retroviruses, but also, say, herpes viruses as well, uh, which can actually stay dormant in a cell for a long, long time, and they can coexist um, with their host for years, even decades. And when you think of AIDS, um, the clinical symptoms of AIDS often arise years, even decades after the initial infection, and this is the reason for it. And so you have these two um, sort of juxtaposed systems of infection that have the relative benefits and disadvantages. And so retroviruses and herpes viruses have chosen this sort of long-lasting living with their hosts. Uh, funnily enough, when I did my undergrad, I, my undergrad uh, sort of research project was on uh, herpes viruses. Um, I decided stupidly, I was like 20 or whatever, and I was like, you know what, I should name my thesis, you know, Undergrad researchers are temporary, herpes is forever. And <laughs> <laughs> it was something really boring in the end, like, you know, like, you're in, yeah, that herpes virus something. I don't remember. I think mine was much better. Anyways. <laughs> and so, going back to this insertion step, where a virus inserts its DNA into the human DNA. So, you get this, so the point of this is that a virus can multiply its genetic material in the absence of actually making any virus or having to um, infect any new cells. So you have this blue cell right here. It's infected, it now turns green. Um, and then you have, as I mentioned, this weird hybrid virus-human DNA. And when a cell divides, it copies all of its genetic material onto all of its progeny cells. So when this green and blue cell divides, it will copy all of its genetic material, including the viral bits as well. And all of these successive cells will contain both human DNA and viral DNA. When we zoom out a bit at a population level, you see the exact same phenomenon. When we typically think about viral infection, you think of something, you know, like the flu. Someone sneezes on you on the tube, three days later you're sick. Sometimes I hate London. In Vancouver, we never had this because we actually didn't have any public transit whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I've been on the tube often enough. It's awful, but fine. Anyway. Um, so you get someone infected with this virus, and we refer to this as horizontal transmission because you basically have a virus going from one person to another through these actual physical viruses. And so what happens when you have these retroviruses infecting a cell, like a sperm cell or a germ cell? Then, as I mentioned again, all of the uh, progeny of this person will carry the DNA of the virus. And you can get populations of people that then start to carry uh, both viral and human DNA. And so how much, how much has this happened? How much are we virus? Um, as I mentioned, we have the central dogma where you have the protein coding bits of the genome. These are considered sort of the important bits. Um, in 2000, there is this thing called the Human Genome Project that aimed to basically sequence every bit of G DNA in the human genome. And what they realized is that the DNA that makes protein is only 2%, which is sort of vaguely disappointing, I think, for a lot of people. Um, in fact, they named the other 98% junk DNA. Um, with my current boss, I decided that because I focus on these sort of non-protein coding genes that I should uh, name my thesis Digging Through the Trash Where I Belong. Again. <laughs> there we are. But in any case, we have 2% of our genome are protein coding genes. In contrast, about 45% of human DNA, mouse DNA, koala DNA, all of this is derived from million-year-old viruses that have invaded our genome and coexisted with us. So it's, you know, a massive, massive amount. 
Um, and lest you be worried about, you know, bits of 500 million year old virus floating around your body, don't worry about that. Um, all of these viruses have since mutated away or been silenced, and in humans at least, they, we've never been able to find infectious virus um, that has arisen from these endogenous retroviruses, as we call them. But when you think about this from an evolutionary standpoint, it's a bit weird. You know, why, you know, if they're so bad for us as we would assume viruses floating around our body to be, why are they still there? Why are they part of our genome? And why haven't we just gotten rid of them? And so the alternative hypothesis then is that maybe these viruses can benefit us. And that's what I'm going to talk to you. I'll give you two examples of this very quickly. Um, oh god, maybe very quickly. <laughs> And there's this sort of, oh, whatever. There is that thick uh, purple bit here. And this is called the syncytial trophoblast. Again, I learned this like two days ago. Um, that is primarily responsible for this nutrient and waste uh, sort of transfer. And if you look at it, uh, there's a lot to look at in this picture. But what's particularly weird about it is that these cells really don't look normal. Typically, you have. Um, you know, a single cell with a single nucleus in it, those are the darker purple spots. Whereas you can see that these cells have a lot of nuclei that are super densely packed, and actually you can't really tell uh, where one cell starts and one cell ends. And in fact, this is reminiscent of what happens when HIV infects a cell. So you can see in this green cell on the right, the nuclei of the cells are stained here in blue, and you can see that all of these cells are fusing together. And the reason for this is that the envelope protein of the virus that I told you about earlier is really, really good at forcing an infected cell to fuse with all of its neighbors. And the reason it does this is that you know it allows basically the virus to spread, um, it's a lot faster, and also it helps the virus escape the immune system. And so the similarity between these two is you know is not a coincidence, otherwise I would be telling you this. Basically, what they found is that this syncytial trophoblast, the development of it, is mediated by a protein called syncytin, which is itself derived from an endogenous retrovirus. And so essentially, humans have realized that, you know, fine, we have these you know, retroviruses in our genome. Turns out they're really good at some things, like fusing cells together, like evading the immune system. Why don't we use it for our own good? And so the strength of this effect is uh, highlighted by the fact that you get a bunch of different species, you know, mice. Um, when you take the syncytin from a mouse, from a koala, from a kangaroo, or whatever, um, all of these have very, very different endogenous retroviruses, but all of these species have hit upon this method of recycling an endogenous retrovirus gene and saying, you know what, this is useful, let's use it. And this is what we call convergent evolution. As my last example, I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain. Uh, again, I don't study the brain. Looked this all up earlier this week. But these are neurons, which I didn't know that bit. But essentially, <laughs> we have these, the, these are sort of the basic units of the cell in the brain, basic cells in the brain. What happens when you receive a stimuli, such as a smell, a touch? You get these uh, transfer of these impulses down these long spine like things to neighboring cells. They transfer their information and signals to neighboring cells, and you get, you know, a response, you know, the whatever. Um, yes. And this is mediated by this bit called the synapse, where you have a transfer of neurotransmitters and so on between one neuron and its neighboring cell, and this is how you get propagation of a brain response. And one of the really key proteins that's involved in this 
is called ARC. Uh, this is shown to be particularly important for sensory, uh, sensory uh, responses, uh, memory development, and so on. And why is this important? When you look at ARC, that's on the left. When you look at the retrovirus on the right, as I showed you, again, they look remarkably similar. And so why might this be? Uh, this is a paper that was actually published, I think, a year ago now, uh, yeah, a year ago. And basically what it found is that ARC <coughs> derives itself from an endogenous retrovirus. And again, when you think about the function of a virus, what's it really good at doing? It's really good at taking bits of uh, protein and bits of genetic material, getting it from one cell to another. When you look at that synapse that I showed you earlier, exact same thing. So essentially what uh, you know, humans, mice, and I think Drosophila as well have all hit upon the system of saying, you know what, here's a protein, that's really good at transferring material from one cell to another. Let's reuse it and use it for our own good. So essentially to conclude, what I want to hope I've convinced you today is that viruses have different approaches to infection and spread. Um, and retroviruses represent one extreme in some way, in that they integrate their genetic material into infected cells and can coexist with their hosts for, uh, you know, at a single individual level for decades, at a population level for millions and millions of years. Humans, as a result of this, are 45% virus, they're sort of viral derived sequences. And what's most interesting to me is that we can recycle these integrated viral sequences for our own benefit. And that's it. Thank you very much for your...